Uh, welcome. My name is Colin Beck. I'm not going to talk too much about myself, uh, except to say that uh, my great-grandfather became a Christian, actually not in Montague, but in Summerside, but brought the faith back to here. This would be late 1800s. And my grandfather and my father and my uncles and my aunts and my cousins and my first cousins and seconds and third and fourth cousins all have gone to this church. And so, uh, and as a kid, we would come here every summer uh, <clears throat> for probably nearly 10 years of my life uh, and were, was taught here in the faith. And for that, we are deeply appreciative. Our talk this morning is called The Hotel California Welcome to the Doctrine of Sin. And we're going to play a clip out of the Hotel California song right now. For those who are online, uh, this will be blanked out because of copyright reasons. Uh, you can use this time to pray uh, or to link to the song online. But don't, maybe don't do that because that, we're doing a, a shorter version of it. We should be back in about four minutes uh, for those who are online. So we'll start with the song right now.
If you know the song, right now you're thinking, why did they stop it right there? Because <laughs> there's this fantastic dual guitar solo. Uh, how many people do not know the song? Raise your hand if you've never heard that song before. A couple of the really... Gene, wow. There's, but most of us have heard the song. Now, I was a fairly big Eagles fan. The, the Eagles started roughly around 1970. Uh, they weren't my top tier of bands, but probably my second tier of bands. Uh, my, actually, my favorite Eagles song is a rare song called Wish You Peace. Does anyone know that song, Wish You Peace? Lovely, lovely song. And I liked Hotel California, but the one thing I recognized is even though there were other Eagle songs I liked better, this was the greatest Eagle song. I mean, it really is a classic, both in the musicianship and the lyrics. And Rolling Stone magazine actually ranks it as number 49 in the top 500 rock songs of all time. And that's probably a pretty good place to have it. Its meaning is kind of obscure, but it ties in with excess and with sin. And I'm going to use it today uh, to focus on sin. And what we're going to talk about today is the Christian doctrine of sin. And I want you to have a deep, deep understanding of the Christian doctrine of sin and evil uh, because of its importance in our day. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the first question is, are we good or are we bad? Who are we? Not who am I and, well, I'm a teacher or I'm a minister or devilish handsome or anything like that. Not that kind of who am I question. But, but who are we as human beings? Uh, are we good or are we bad? Uh, next slide. In Genesis, it, it talks about who we are as Christians. And it, it says that we're made in God's image. Uh, that we're made in the likeness of God. So part of the answer to that question, you can go to the next slide, is we're made in the image of God, we're also made good. That, that when God created man, he looked at the earth and he said, everything is good. In fact, it's very good. So there's a nobility in the original creation of man. Next slide. But then Genesis 3 comes. And you have the fall, and sin enters in to the world. And that brings up the doctrine of what historically has been called the doctrine of original sin, and inherited sin, and in that, that we as humans have a sinful nature. And so you say, well, are we good or are we bad? Well, it's a bit of a paradox from the Christian perspective, because both of those things are true, and you have to remember both of those things. We have an original nobility, we're created in the image of God, but we also have this tremendous disability, this sin nature that courses through our beings. And both of those things are there, and we're going to see that throughout the message. Now, when you come to this uh, type of question, these big questions, of course, your most important source of information is Calvin. Not Calvin the theologian, next slide, but Calvin the cartoon, uh, which uh, has often very deep philosophical insights. Now, how many people read Calvin and Hobbes? Few of you. The rest of you, I don't know what we're going to do with you, but you should all go out and buy a Calvin and Hobbes book. So you have Calvin, who's the little boy who's got this vivid imagination, and his pet tiger, Hobbes. And they're going out 
sledding. And Calvin's kind of a little wild and crazy. So they're sledding down this hill, and for Calvin, that means you go as fast as you possibly can. As he goes down in the third caption, uh, Calvin says to Hobbes, Hobbes, do you think human nature is good or evil? Well, Hobbes is only thinking about the trees. And then Calvin says, I mean, do you think people are basically good with a few bad tendencies or basically bad with a few good tendencies? There's a rock up ahead, look out. Or as a third people, do, a third possibility, do you think people are just crazy and who knows why they do anything? Not so close to the edge. Well, what do you think? Are people good, bad, or crazy? And of course, then they crash and... Hobbes, with his head in the snowbank, says, I choose crazy. And, and, and people can be a little bit uh, crazy. They also can be good and they can be bad. Sometimes people can do amazingly good things. And sometimes humans can do amazingly awful things. Next slide. Now, this is an old question. Uh, we have here two uh, Chinese philosophers. These would be followers of Confucius, kind of the second and, most, and third most important philosophers in Chinese history. And they took different sides on this debate. Mencius said, if you let people follow their feelings, they will be able to do good. This is what is meant by saying that human nature is good. And he thought the natural flow of human nature was towards goodness, kind of like the natural flow of water downhill is downhill. And he says, now you can block up water, you can dam it, you can do all kinds of other things to move it in different directions, but the natural flow is downhill. And he says, if we do things to humans, you know, we restrict them or whatever, maybe they end up doing wrong things. And that was... His thought. His next philosopher, Shun Tzu, he said, human nature is evil and goodness is caused by intentional activity. So that he's basically saying there is this sinful nature and that the only way to get out of that is through intentional activity. You can kind of take that home and think, how does that compare to Christian philosophy? But I'm not going to do that to you, for you right now. I'll let you do that on your own. Now, of course, some people might say, well, I'm good. And maybe you're not so good. You know, like maybe you guys are all bad, and, but I'm pretty good. And, and if you're under the illusion that you're good and everybody else is bad, I can't help you this morning. Okay, there's nothing I can do. Uh, to help you through that illusion. But most people think we're, you know, humans are essentially decent uh, people. You know, maybe if you're raised in a bad environment, you become a bad person. But if you're raised in a good environment, you're going to generally be a good person. But then you kind of think about, well, do people in ghettos, to people in bad homes, do any of them ever turn out good? Some of them turn out brilliant, don't they? I mean, what some people overcome in their lives is incredible. And what about good people? Maybe people raised in nice, rich, nice homes. Do they ever turn out bad? <laughs> Maybe one or two, right? How often, you know, you have these serial killers. When I first did this message, we had that serial killer in Las Vegas. And uh, the guy who shot them all down from the hotel room. I think it was the biggest serial killing ever. And just in a couple of weeks ago, we had the serial killer in Florida. And the comments about both of them, the first one, nobody saw the first guy. He hadn't been in trouble with the law. The second guy would have been the type of guy who would just attend church and be your neighbor, and, and nobody saw it coming. They seemed like normal, decent human beings, but they committed awful atrocities. 
Now, the Bible speaks to this question. And essentially what the Bible says is that man's creation originally, he's created good. Maybe there's, I should qualify that a little bit. Uh, there's a little debate. This, this will be helpful as you think through Genesis, first three chapters of Genesis. You see, the Catholics had a position on the creation of man. So when, when man falls, did he fall from a perfect place or from a place of innocence? So is man created perfect or is man created innocent? And the Catholic doctrine is that he's created perfect, that Adam and Eve were perfect. And the Greek Orthodox doctrine is man's created innocent. So that if you're created innocent, it means there's no sin, but you have to grow to a full righteousness. And I'm not going to go into all the details in this, but I think it's a profound question that really helps you to understand it. But I'm, I'm convinced the Greek Orthodox are right, that we're created innocent, and as we resisted sin, if Adam and Eve had resisted the sin, and then there would have been another temptation, and they would have resisted that. And if they had done that, they would have grown into perfection or into uh, full righteousness and full humanity that God meant them to have. So we come to Genesis chapter 3, next slide. And you all know the story in the garden. Adam and Eve are there. They're told, you can't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but you can eat of any other tree. And so then this happens. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. They realized they were sinful. They had lost their innocence. They were full of guilt. And so they sewed fig leaves together. We're going to come to a line in Hotel California about the alibis. We, we try to cover up our sin. You see, and you sew fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, there, there's three things that happen here. And it, it relates not only to to Adam and Eve's temptation, but to our temptation. You see, she sees that the food, the tree was good for food. And, and so that's a temptation towards materialism. Uh, we see material things, and maybe God doesn't want us to have them, but we want them, you know? It's like, I got to have that new convertible sports car, whatever it may be. We have this temptation for material things. We also see that it's pleasing to the eye. And that's the temptation, I think, to elicit passion. You know, things look good and we want it. Or people look good and we want them. And also, it was desirable for gaining wisdom. And that's the temptation to pride. That maybe if I eat of this apple or this fruit... I'm going to become as wise as God. And so you have those temptations. There's still the temptations that we deal with today. Come to the next slide. So Adam and Eve, they eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. They're, of course, cast out into the garden. The next story is the story of Cain and Abel. And Abel offers up a sacrifice from the best of his flocks. Cain brings a bunch of vegetables. Not the best of his vegetables. Uh, maybe there were a few old rotten potatoes in there. We don't know, you know. But not the best. And God accepts Abel's offering because Abel gave of his best. But God rejects Cain's offering 
because Cain just kind of gives God something he hopes that God is going to accept. And so Cain's rejected and Abel's accepted and Cain's angry. And Cain's resentful. And he's mad at God. And he's mad at the universe. Like, why is it this way? The system's wrong. It's against me. And usually when we sin, we blame the system, right? Or maybe we blame the person who created the system. And that's what God, Cain does. And so God says to Cain, he says, why are you angry? Sin is crouching at the door. It hasn't quite come in, but you're full of jealousy, you're full of rage, and sin's out there crouching at the door. And he says, its desire is for you. Sin wants to have you. Satan wants to have you. Its desire is to control you and master you. And as as you think about this, the easiest way to think about it is someone who's caught into a very serious addiction, whether it's gambling or drinking or drugs or a sexual addiction or can be other addictions as well. When you're caught in that addiction, it's like you start out taking the drug And maybe you feel in control at first, but eventually the drug controls you. And so sin wants to master you. But he says, but you must master it. And we all experience these temptations and sin crouches us at our door. Now let's come to our next slide. Hotel California. Don Henley, who wrote the song, by the way, David just informed me the bass guitarist in the Eagles died this week, uh, which uh, is kind of sad. Don Henley said the song Hotel California was about excess. Now, I think that's true. I think that's mainly what it's about. But you have to understand the life of a rock and roller, especially the 60s and 70s rock and rollers. Now, I know I looked like I was probably just born in 1980 or 1990, (laughs) but I actually lived through the 60s and the 70s. And I was a major music fan. David, who's here, can, can confirm that I had a massive record collection. And, and basically, I was a hippie at heart. Uh, That's, I had big curly, blonde hair, they're saying, oh, he's lying, he couldn't have had that. That is true, I did. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, but the, six, the rock and rollers in the 60s and the 70s, it, it, was, it was insane, you know. They would go into hotel rooms and completely trash them because they could. And, and for a rock and rollers, they just got away with a whole lot more than we did. Uh, they could do these things, uh, excessive party and excessive drinking, like just excess was just was the norm. And I kind of think that Don Henley thinks, well, you know, all we're concerned about as rock and rollers is if we go too far. But, 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 it, but all of sin is really, from God's perspective, an excess. That as we get involved in the things we shouldn't get involved in. It pulls us down. It's just that some people, because of their station in life, can do greater sins uh, than others just because they have the power uh, to do that. And I think the song is really a commentary on sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to master it, to master you, but you must master it. Next slide. Just come back to the previous slide for a second. Oh, yeah, no, okay, no, we're right. Next slide. Good. Okay, so starts out some really great poetry. He, he pulls in all the senses, and he starts out with sight on a dark desert highway. 
and you can see this guy driving through the desert at night, and all there is is the stars in the sky, maybe the moon, no lights, and you, you can just see that scene driving on this straight road, just sand all around you. On a dark desert highway, cool wind in my air. So you have the sight and then the cool wind and the wind's blowing through his convertible and blowing through his air. And there's a sweet smell of Kalitos, which is a flower, and you can smell the flower. And so all his senses are firing and he drives along and he gets tired and he pulls up to the Hotel California. Now the Hotel California, and we've put this picture here very intentionally, this is probably the hotel that is being pictured. It was the Beverly Hills Hotel, very famous hotel. All the great movie stars and movie actresses would stay there. Um, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, Faye Dunaway. I know for you young people, they don't mean anything, but for the old people, like we know what big stars they were. And all the big stars would stay there, and it was a place of excess. You know, only the very rich and famous would go there and kind of what happened there uh, stayed there. So in one sense, it refers to the Beverly Hills Hotel, but it's the Hotel California. And, and it's kind of seeing California as a hotel. Now, again, you young people may not know this, but in the 60s, all of the young hippies left their homes in the east, they left their homes in Canada, the Midwest, and they all went to California. And there was peace, love, and dope, and free sex, and addiction, and all kinds of things. It was a great movie. How many of you have seen The Jesus Revolution? Two of you! Okay, so get out a piece of paper, write down the Jesus Revolution, and watch it on Netflix. It's a story, like, during this period in California, there's a terrible lot of excess, and you'll see that in the story. Uh, the star in this story, by the way, is Fraser, uh, from the sitcom from the 90s. And, but it tells the story of the founding of the Vineyard Church, and, and a move of God that happened in this incredible period of excess. And, and it's, it's really quite a remarkable story of God, how God drew in so many young people uh, to serve him at that time. So Jesus' revolution, try to watch it. But California kind of became this hotel to everyone who wanted to come. And there were parts of it that were positive, and there were parts of it that were full of excess and very negative. But I also think it just refers to our world of excess. That, that it's just a temptation to go down many roads of sin. Okay, next slide. So he comes up to the Hotel California. And there she stood in the doorway. And I heard the mission bell. You see, so he comes, he sees this beautiful woman. And like, he thinks maybe me and her... Right? But he also hears the mission bell because California was founded by Catholic missionaries. And so it's kind of like the good angel and the bad angel. And, and which way is he going to go? And he says, and I was thinking to myself that this could be heaven or this could be hell. And you see, Eve, when she had the fruit in front of her, she was thinking to herself, this could be heaven. But God said not to eat of it, and it could be hell. And unfortunately, it led to hell and to exile. And sin kind of presents itself that way. It, it presents itself as a really positive thing, but it can turn against us. Next slide. Talks about this girl. He said, her mind is Tiffany twisted, and she's got the Mercedes Benz. Tiffany, uh, I had to look this up, it's apparently jewelry. Uh, anyone have any Tiffany jewelry? I don't know. Apparently it's jewelry. The Mercedes Benz I knew was a car. And it's a, you know, of course, a very expensive car of the stars and luxurious car. And so she's very materialistic. And she's got pretty, pretty boys that she calls friends. And later on it talks about them dancing. 
In this very interesting line, it says, some dance to remember and some dance to forget because the pain is just overwhelming. Next slide. Welcome to the Hotel California. Such a lovely place, such a lovely face. There's plenty of room in the Hotel California. You see, the road to heaven is what? Narrow. And the road to hell is wide. There's plenty of room in the Hotel California. So Satan will welcome you in to the life of excess. And they're living it up at the Hotel California. And what a nice surprise, bring your alibis. And you have to bring your alibis because you have to hide your sin behind the lies and the cover-up because of the guilt you feel over the sin. Next line, next slide. There's mirrors on the ceiling and there's pink champagne on ice. And I think mirrors on the ceiling refers to sexual temptation. Pink champagne on ice refers to the alcohol and drugs and that kind of thing. And then she said, we are all just prisoners here of our own device. And this is kind of the key line. You see, sin is crouching at the door. And Satan is saying, eat of the fruit, right? Sin crouches, eat of the fruit. The temptation is there. But the decision as to what we do is always our decision. But when we choose to obey God, there's freedom. When we choose to disobey God, we fall in to sin and corruption. And it's very, very hard to escape. And each decision we make in our lives is like that. We have the decision, but what we choose can either set us free or make us prisoners of our own device. Next slide. And in the master's chambers, they gathered for the feast. So they had this feast, and they stared with steely eyes, but they just couldn't kill the beast. Because the beast, sin, gets a hold of us, and it can trap us, and it can be so hard to kill the beast. Come to the next slide. The last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the way I was before. So he's into this life of excess and sin, but he wants to get back to his innocence. Probably Adam and Eve felt that same way. They wanted to get back to the garden. And the night man says, oh, relax. In the Hotel California, in the life of sin... In the life of excess, we're programmed to receive. And you can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. You see? Because if sin gets you. If you make those decisions and you fall deeper and deeper into sin, it's so hard to check out of that. It's not impossible. And that's the gospel. But it's difficult. And sin can get us and sin can capture us. Next slide. We're looking at, oh, yeah, the Christian doctrine of sin. And, and these two verses, this verse and the next verse I'm going to show to you, kind of sum it up for me. What is the Christian doctrine of sin? Well, first, that sin is crouching at the door. It desires to master us and control us, but we must master it. Next slide. I'll go to your next slide. And go to your next slide. Jeremiah says this. You should memorize this verse. The heart is wick wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Or who can know it? 
The heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. That's kind of in a nutshell the Christian doctrine of sin. Now, you see, you think, no, 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 my heart's good. You see, aren't we supposed to follow our heart? Isn't that what you're told in school? Isn't that what society tells you? Follow your heart. And I just want to say, there's a lot of bad advice out there. One of the worst bits of advice is to follow your heart. Because the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? Now you think your heart is good. Jeremiah's saying, no, the human heart's weak and deceitful. So my advice is, you don't, you never follow your heart. You have to understand your heart. Okay? You, and, and for you young people, your, people are going to say, follow your heart. Well, you have, no, don't follow it, but understand it. Know what your heart is saying. And that's important. And sometimes, if your heart is good and it's pure, well, then follow it. But, boys, you better be clear on where your heart is. But so know your heart. But don't follow your heart. Follow God. Follow the Word of God. Follow the example of Jesus. And when you do that, he will start to change your heart. And when your heart becomes a heart of flesh and a heart that's soft and a heart that's attuned to the Spirit of God, then your heart will naturally start to do good. But don't just blindly follow your heart. You see, we have a sin problem. And the sin problem's in me as an individual. It's in our society. It's in our environment. Next slide. You know, I'm a, anyone, a big, anyone an Agatha Christie fan? Ah, uh, she's just great. So Agatha, the classic whodunit. One of her lines in one of her books is, everybody is capable of murder. Now, that on one hand is just a way to get you to think that anybody in the book could have done it. But on the other hand, it's a truth. Everybody's capable of murder. Jesus says the same thing. Jesus says, you know, you've heard that it said, do not murder. But then he says, if you call someone a fool, basically you're murdering their reputation, aren't they? And there's many ways we can fall into this kind of murderous type of rage. Next slide. Martin Luther talked about the doctrine of original sin. And he said sin, uh, the way he expressed it is that we are curved in on ourselves. That, that is what the doctrine of sin means. That is humans, instead of looking to God, relying on God, having this spirit of dependence on God, we kind of get curved in on ourselves and we get focused on ourselves. And you have here the picture of Narcissus who looks in the had his reflection in the water, and all he sees is himself. And that's where we get narcissism from. And we have lots of narcissism in our society, from Donald Trump to the insane number of genders and pronouns that we're trying to push on everybody today. And it's a very narcissistic uh, type of action. So. So sin is being curved in on yourselves. Next slide. Okay. How many have heard of Alexander Solzhenitsyn? A couple of you. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago. It is probably the most important book of the 20th century. Uh, the most important book of the 19th century was Uncle Tom's Cabin, which basically ended slavery in the States had a big impact around the world as well. Uh, and the Gulag Archipelago basically brought down communism in the late 1980s and 90s. Solzhenitsyn wrote the Gulag Archipelago. The Gulags are prison camps. Horrible, awful prison camps. Now, the Gulag Archipelago, and if you buy it, and some of you should, 
buy the, con the edit, the condensed version. <laughs> it's about three volumes long, so get the condensed version. It's only about 500 pages. Uh, but get it. It's both the most devastating book I've ever read. You, when you read through the stories of the Gulag and what happened in the Russian prison camps, the evil is inconceivable. You could not sit down and invent the stories of what the Russian prison guards did to the prisoners and what the whole Russian system did to, the, to their fellow Russians. It, it's, it's horrors beyond imagining. It's also the most spiritually profound book I ever read. And Solzhenitsyn says, I thank God for the gulag. He said, because I found God in the gulag. And it's, it's just so deeply profound. But this Solzhenitsyn then starts to reflect as he looks at the evil in the system and in the people. And we can kind of look at the evil and we can think, well, the evil's just in the system. You know, we talk about systemic evil. And there is systemic evils. But the systemic evils come from the evils in our hearts. And so he said, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were only necessary to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. Now what he's talking about here, you know, you're a prisoner. The main prisoners were political prisoners and, and Christians. Tons of Christians in the gulags. Baptist, Catholics, Orthodox, all kinds. And they were there because they wouldn't bow to the communist God. And he says, so you've got those are the good people. The bad people are the prison guards and the people who make the system and the snitches who are uh, part of the prisoners. And he said, if we can just get those good camps, God can come down, he can put a bowl of lightning on all these bad people, and we'll just have the good people left behind, and then everything would be great, right? We just get rid of all the bad people, and then we just have good people left. And he says, no, it's not like that. He says, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. That means each one of us here today, the line of good and evil cuts through our hearts. And sin is crouching at the door of every one of us. And it wants to master us, but we must master it. And then he has this line, this kind of such a sad, tragic line. Who's willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? And it's hard to destroy your own heart even when it's full of sin. Next slide. Jordan Peterson is a Canadian psychologist, profound thinker. Peterson said when he would go into his 101 classes, he said his goal in his psychology 101 was to try to convince his students that if they lived in Germany, they would have been prison guards. You see, you think if you lived in Germany, you'd be like Oscar Schindler, right? Or you'd be like Corey Ten Boom, and you would rescue the Jews, right? That's because I've got a good heart. I'm a good person. That's what I would do. But you see, it was people like us who were the prison guards who joined the army, who supported that whole Nazi system. You know, there were some people who, of course, were sociopaths, and, and, and they were at the top. And Hitler had a way of picking sociopaths. But you have to get the whole population to go along with it. And so we all can be prison guards, and that's likely where most of us would have been, supporting the Nazi system. And so he... And, and, Peterson does this long, deep dive into evil, trying to understand, and we're going to do a little bit more later. But if you want to grow some teeth, it is a really good under, thing to understand that you could be an Auschwitz guard. If you recognize you are a monster, then you can deal with that and do some good. So if you know that sin is crouching at your door, 
that good and evil courses through your heart, that you're a potential monster, then you can start to deal with that evil and try to master the sin rather than let the sin master you. Next slide. How many have seen the movie Sound of Freedom? Only my wife. How many have heard of the movie Sound of Freedom? A few of you. Okay, here's what I'm going to tell you. I think it's still on in Summerside. There's some movies, but I'll kind of lay it this way. There's some things you have to go and see. If anyone ever been to Poland? Well, if you go to Poland, you have to go to Auschwitz. Now, if you go to Auschwitz, how many have been to one of these uh, uh, museums for the Holocaust? Just a few of you. You have to go to a museum for the Holocaust. It will be the most horrible, devastating thing you will ever experience in your life. You, it's not fun. It's not, like, it's, it's just awful. I mean, you're like, you're just being kicked with the evil of humanity. It, it's the most devastating experience. But you have to experience it because it was true. The sound of freedom is the same thing. Sound of Freedom is a story about child sex trafficking. It's absolutely the most stunning movie I've ever seen. I, I cried through half of the movie. You know, you don't, you don't come out of this movie and say, was that a good movie? No, like it's, who cares? The story is so profound, and it's a true story. The story is about this guy in the middle, Tim Ballard, who gives up his job. There's about, I think he says, about two million kids in the world today in child sex trafficking. And he's devoted his life with his wife's support to rescuing uh, these children. And then Jim Caviezel on the left there plays Tim Ballard. Uh, go to the next slide. And so Tim Ballard and Caviezel talk with Jordan Peterson. And... There, and I, I won't go into the details. It, it's like reading the Gulag Archipelago. This stuff is just so devastating, you don't even want to put your mind there. But to some degree, you have to. But he talks about how does someone get to the point where they're watching these horrible pornographic films or worse, trafficking children. And Peterson said, your movement from norm normality to absolute perversity is a consequence of 10,000 micro-violations of your own conscience. So you start watching one little porn movie, and then that doesn't give you quite enough, so you watch another, and you watch another, and it gets harder and deeper and more perverse, and you just take little step by little step by little step, and all of a sudden, you're into incredible evil. That's the developmental course of such a lovely descent into hell. You don't get to that point of watching without hundreds or thousands of hours of increasingly demented voluntary fantasy. And now listen what he says about the fantasy. And that is allow the allowing of the spirit of sin that would otherwise only crouch on your doorstep. You know, you're so having the temptation to watch pornographic videos is not the sin. The sin is watching them. That, it's only on your doorstep, but then you let it enter your house. And you let it have its way with you. It's like a collaborative venture with Satan himself. Go to the next slide. He, he talks about what tragedy is. And he's talking about this in relation to Ballard. Ballard shares some stories that... And, and Ballard went through post-traumatic stress syndrome. And Peterson says, you don't have post-traumatic stress disorder unless you have both tragedy and malevolence. It's not enough just to go through, say, cancer. You don't get post-traumatic stress necessarily from cancer. 
But if someone had inflicted that cancer upon you, well, then that would be different. Um, and what people generally have to do to recover from that is to develop a rather profound philosophy of evil. Now you say, well, why am I talking about this today? There's a lot of evil in the world today. And you need to have a profound philosophy of evil. And I know I'm going on a little longer than I should, but this is so important. We need to have a profound... We need to understand the evil of the world so we can fight it in our own lives and we can fight it in the world. And he says... The capacity of evil lurks in the hearts of everyone and that our fundamental or moral obligation as we sojourn here on earth is to overcome that proclivity, that means tendency, within us and also to stand up against it in the external world. So when you understand sin, you understand the evil within, you can fight it and try to master it. Next slide. Now this is all very bleak. And when I, when I originally preached this message, I called it the wonderful doctrine of sin. You'll understand that in a minute. And it's, it's a wonderful doctrine in two senses. We know the end of the story. The end of the story is Jesus can save us, right? That, that sin doesn't have to master us. And that's the gospel. But there's something we need to get to before that really kicks in. And we kind of think, well, the doctrine of sin is very pessimistic, but it should lead us to a hopeful realism. And the first step in becoming a good person. So you have to ask yourself, do I want to become a good person? Do I want to become like Christ? That's what got Tim Ballard off rescuing kids. It was a call of Christ in his life. So we want to develop this hopeful realism. So this will be, we're, we're coming to the end. But I want to go over this. So this is my father. And a quote from my father. So I used to talk with my father. And I'd maybe mention some terrible tragedy, terrorist act or whatever. And my father would always say to me, he'd say, Colm, welcome to the doctrine of sin. People are evil. Okay, now my father was a psychiatrist, for those who don't know it. So this kind of comes from this. He was also a very profound Christian and a profound thinker. The Christian doctrine of sin, that wonderful doctrine, the doctrine of sin, that wonderful doctrine which more than anything else preserves us against moral shock in our day-to-day -day existence. The Christian should not expect his fellow man to be good because the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. The psychiatrist should not expect his fellow man to be good. And he isn't. If you make this Christian assumption about your fellow man, he will ever, hardly ever let you down. See, why are we disappointed in people? Well, because we think I'm good and they're good. And when they do something mean to me, well, that's, that's terrible. Because that's not the way it's supposed to be. But no, that's the way people are. And if you kind of can accept the Christian doctrine of sin, you can accept it not as it being okay. Sin is never okay. But you can accept, okay, I'm caught in sin, and this friend of mine or this partner of mine is also caught in sin. So we have more empathy and sympathy. The doctrine of sin allows us psychiatrists, as it should our preachers, to accept man as he is. To accept him realistically, to accept him in all his contrariety and in his utter complexity. The good along with the bad, the perverse along with the angelic. Next. It also allows us to accept ourselves as we are. To accept the evil in our own nature. Now, see, when we think, when we know there's something bad in us. 
What we tend to do is we try to cover it up. We say, this is, this is bad. I don't want anyone to know about this. And I'm going to try to hide it. But it's still there. Now what the Bible teaches is we are to confess our sins. We're to know our sin. Don't, don't hide from it. Let God show you the sin. And here's where the gospel comes in. Because if you share that sin with God, He is faithful and just to forgive it. If we confess our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us. So we can come to God with all our awfulness. But if we hide our awfulness, we can't do anything. But it's real. We want to overcome it. We don't want to stay there. But we deal with it through the grace of God. To accept our own sinfulness and thus in relate to compassion and full empathy with all those anxious and distressed sinners in our office situation. To use the wonderful words of D.L. Moody, there but for the grace of God go I. And that's where we have to be, folks, that we're living in the grace of God. That's, that's all we live. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a great guy. You know? I'm not a great guy because... I'm devilishly handsome. That's, no. God, in the grace of God, forgives my sin and he can change me. In this context, we can relate to our patients as they come to us. We can identify ourselves closely and personally with them while we objectively, resolutely, and persistently confront them with their sinfulness. And so, confronting people and confronting our own sin is important. We don't want to stay or wallow in our sin. But we have to face it so we can deal with it. Next slide. One more. There we go. We're going to kind of bring this to a close now. We're going to come into a time of communion. When we come to the time of communion... I'm going to put a prayer on the slide. Uh, and I don't want any music or anything on in communion. I want it to be completely silent. Uh, I want our communion time to be a time of reflection on our own hearts. And you can use the prayer that's on the slide just to have your own prayers. Uh, it's a prayer from St. Ambrose, 1700 years old prayer. It's a great prayer. Uh, after that, we're going to sing Rock of Ages Cleft for Me. And I just want to explain a little bit about this. Rock of Ages Cleft for Me is one of the great old hymns. But I never liked it. In 2017, the week before I first preached this sermon, we had a service at our church. It was a Tuesday night. It was just a worship and prayer service. It was a profound service. It, like it was so deeply moving. And in that service, we sang this hymn. And for the first time in my life, I fell in love with this hymn. And the hymn says, Rock of Ages. That's Jesus. He's the Rock of Ages. He's the one we can take everything to and we can hang on to him. He's solid. Rock of Ages cleft for me. He died for us. His, his body was nailed to the tree. Let me hide myself in thee. Because he's the rock of ages, we can hide ourselves in him. We can take everything to him. We can confess the worst awful thoughts and deeds in our lives to him. Because he's faithful and just to forgive us. Let the water in the blood from your riven side which flowed. You, you see, he's on the cross, and he's dying, and the blood's flowing from his forehead, and it's flowing from his side. And that blood covers, I think it covers, is it 32% of our sins, David, or is it 48% of our sins? 
How many, what percent of our sins would you? Keep going up. Over 90? Over 90. Would it be 100%? Sold. Sold. There's nothing you can do to separate yourself from the love of God other than to move away from God. Nothing else. There's no wickedness you've ever done because His blood was shed for you. Be of sin the double cure, save me from its guilt and power. This is a peculiar Wesleyan doctrine. Now, it's biblical doctrine too, but John Wesley really formed it. And, and sin, you see, has two things. We tend to think of sin as, as the guilt. I, I don't want to be guilty. We get rid of the guilt. We don't get thrown in prison, right? You know, that's, that's nice. But there's also the power of sin. There's the sin that masters us. And you see, what's the cure for the guilt? Well, that's pretty easy. The cure for the guilt is the blood of Jesus. He forgives us. What's the cure when sin masters us and overpowers us? It's the blood of Jesus. It's the grace of God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we want... To be of sin, the double cure saved me from its guilt and power. We're going to ask the servers to come forward at this time. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, one more slide. Good. Uh, we'll ask the servers to come forward for the communion. Shane, would you offer a prayer for us? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for your cure. We thank you, Father, that as we gather around this table, we partake of the broken body of your new covenant, the shed blood of the forgiveness of our sins. And God, we just ask for a blessing upon each and every one here, Father, blessing as we partake of this, as we proclaim your death to each other and to the world, Father, because the cure of death was your son. So God, just, um, just give this a time, Father, of fellowship, because that's what you want at this table. You want us to fellowship with you and with each other. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. As we serve, let's just take a time of silent meditation.
I want you to go back to the previous slide. This is a, one of the world's most famous prayers, uh, but it's only within the Orthodox churches. But it's, it's a great prayer. It's based on uh, what Jesus says, I think, in Luke 18. And it's, it's such a helpful prayer. Now, I want to give you one, one way to overcome the, the power of sin. So you have an evil thought. Now, I know I'm the only one here who ever has an evil thought, but, but for the one or two other people who might have an evil thought at times, what do you do when that evil thought hits? And here's the key. You repent of it. Okay? You say, God, forgive me for that evil thought. And this, if you can memorize this prayer, will help you through those times. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's all say that together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's a real valuable prayer to memorize. And then you get it, because the sin's always going to crouch at the door. It's going to be there every day. And we have to deal with it. And when you deal with it early, then you can deal with it well. We're going to close with the song, Rock of Ages. I'm going to do something a little different. This is, I'm going to ask uh, Shane and Velda if you would come forward. Uh, not to sing. <laughs> Just to kind of maybe sit on the side. Maybe David and Lorraine, if you would also come forward. Um, <clears throat> and we'll have Paul's wife as well come forward. And I'm going to have these people up here for prayer. And maybe there's something you're trying to deal with in your life and you just want, you need prayer. And if that's the case, you come forward. Uh, you can come forward and uh, pray with any one of these people. We're going to ask the worship team to come back at this time. Uh, I'll stay up and join you if that's okay. And we're going to sing uh, this great hymn. Rock of Ages. Uh, so let's all stand together.